Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara, and welcome back to our podcast. I have a personality quirk that has been one of the greatest curses and blessings of my life. I find things interesting. And when I find an area or topic or word or thing that I don't know about, I have a compulsion to find out more, and down the rabbit hole I go. For all of you who are unfamiliar with that particular blessing or curse, here's how that might go in your daily life. So you're getting ready to head for bed one night. You go down the hall to turn the light off. You glance up at the wall as you hit the switch. And there's a picture of your dad from somewhere in the 1950s standing next to a brown and white bull. So you say to yourself, that's a good size Hereford. Hereford. Hereford? Which way am I supposed to pronounce that? You know it will bug you until you know, so you go back down the hallway to the computer where you quickly ask Dr. Bing. Up pops the pictures of the cow, a map a soccer match, a bridge, and other things. Okay, but I want the word part. So I go look up the other thing on the results page. The American Hereford Association webpage. The 10 best things to do in Hereford, England. And Zillow home values for a town in Arizona, in Colorado, in Texas. You say to yourself, huh, wonder where those are. But you restrain yourself from clicking on the map. You then see that Wikipedia lists Hereford, so you click there first. Okay, so now we're in a town in England over by Wales on the River Wye. Huh, never heard of River Wye. Don't click, Lara. don't click. The nicest thing, it does have a pronunciation thingy. So I click there and yep, it's pretty British sounding. Hereford. Wait, is that just the town but not the cow? I'll cross check. But one second, the Wikipedia page catches my eye again because a clickable link in blue in one of the sentences has a phrase, time immemorial in there which was a phrase Carrie Fowler used when he spoke to us, so it kind of stuck in my head. I can see what might... Don't click, Lara. Don't click. I scroll down the page, and it talks about Hereford. I see the soccer picture connection. I see that it was a major cattle market site, which might explain my dad standing next to the one over here in America somehow. I control myself and don't follow any of the other links and continue to scroll until I get to the notable people section. Wow! Hey, Muppet Man Frank Oz was born here. So were Mott the Hoople Bands and almost all of the Pretenders. N- no clicking. And then my mouse accidentally rests on the See Also section where it hovers over Herefordshire. A red flag with a big cow head pops up. I control myself admirably and do not follow the link. But back to the cross-check part I was supposed to do for the pronunciation. I go up where it says Hereford, disambiguation. But first, wait, what's disambiguation? I better check that quickly. Wikipedia uses it to resolve conflicts that arise when a potential article title is ambiguous, most often because it refers to more than one subject covered. Okay, I get that. Good. Back to Hereford. Damn it. We're also full of Herefords in Maryland, Pennsylvania, South Dakota, and more. Three listings in the UK. Okay, scroll past if you value your life, Lara. Cattle. A breed of cattle widely used in temperate areas. Good. Let's see about the pronunciation part and we're done. I go to follow the link, but right below it, wait, wait, there are Hereford pigs too. I've heard those are yummy. Is it pronounced the same way? Let's check. Damn it, go to bed, Laura. So that gives you an idea of what my life might be like. There's always something interesting to learn, and the more you find out, the less you feel like you know, so the more you want to find out. When I was younger, I wasn't a terribly extroverted person by nature, but that has definitely changed. Curiosity, plain and simple. Because that thing that happens with the word and the rabbit hole, it happens with people, too. Lots of people are just plain interesting when you take the time to talk to them. They are exponentially more rabbit holish than Bing or Wikipedia are, believe it or not. And when you think about the miles we've covered and the number of people we've met in our travels doing interviews and the things we talk about and the things that that leads to, you'll realize that never, ever, ever will we run out of content. The podcast we're bringing you today is another one in our Colorado series. 
For those of you that didn't get to hear our earlier January podcasts, it's the month that the annual Denver event called the National Western Stock Show is held, so we figured that that was a fitting direction. We met today's guest in a circuitous manner. Here's how it started. We went to the National Western, and we spent three days running around in video and audio bliss. One of the things we really enjoyed was the draft horse displays, which were a combination of all types of things, two-hitch farm teams, jump and pull, six-hitch big teams, one horse or mule buggies, and all kinds of other matchups. But one of our favorites was the drafts. And no, that's not the Denver microbrew we're talking about, although Rick is fond of those too. The draft horse teams are absolutely awesome. Anyway, when we were on one of the shows, we saw a little team of Suffolk Punch horses and got all excited because we knew how rare they were. After the show, we ran to the barns and found them, and we met Ken Spann and Val Barnica of Wybar Hitch. You may remember them from our very first podcast. So while chatting with them for a few minutes as they were unhitching the team, they told us we'd be welcome to come and visit them on the site in Gunnison, where the whole herd lives. We, of course, jumped on that. Six months later, we found ourselves at the Gunnison Rodeo at O'Dark 30, filming Ken hooking up a team, getting ready for Val to drive the wagon all over town for the tourists. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen someone hitch a team, but it is no easy task, I found. It takes hours. In the course of the hitch, I snuck a question or two in there for Ken, and one question led to another and another. There were about 467 new topics that I wanted to pursue from that conversation, and it was just with the horses standing still. But then, Ken had Val turn the six-horse team to move the wagon on its wheel. The horizontal one under the seat, that is. And it was a thing of beauty. Let me tell you, backing up or turning a whole bunch once they're all hitched up is one of the prettiest things you'll ever see. If you see it done up close, and if you know what it takes to do it. But then, Ken said something like, you should have seen the Teamsters that come off the mountain with a load. That was driving. My dad could tell you about it. He still uses horses to hay on the ranch. And we were hooked, of course. So then, Ken, do you think your dad might talk to us? The upshot of the story is that we then got to go over and talk to Ken's dad on that trip. Lee Spann, owner of the Spann Ranch, spent an afternoon talking about a lifetime of cattle ranching in one of the more challenging regions in Colorado. I was enthralled. If you think about the rabbit hole concept and how life often goes, you realize what focus, concentration, and fortitude it takes to stick with something. I can't even manage to get down the hallway in my house without mentally ending up in Hereford, England, four hours down the road. We go to see the railhead history at the stock show in Denver and end up talking cattle with a rancher in Gunnison. Again, the pull of the rabbit hole. I absolutely love our life and the joy we get in exploring new things, and I would not change it for the world. But I do want to recognize something that comes to my mind when I think of this interview and the man we spoke with for a few hours on a Colorado afternoon. This man has stuck with this one thing his whole life. And it's not an easy thing, no matter how much he obviously loves the thing he was born to do. To say it's hard work to run a cattle operation is a serious understatement of the sheer determination and fortitude it takes day after day after day, day in and day out. For more years than most of our listeners have been walking around, he has kept the ranch and its purpose alive. No calling in sick, no PTO, No vacation time, no holiday escapism. If the cattle need to be fed, watered, and checked every day, you do it. 90 degrees or 20 below. Through good times and bad, wars and peace, he is there producing food to help us be secure with our food supply. And that is a topic on which I find it easy to stay focused. With my sincere thanks, here's Lee Spann. Uh, my name is Lee Spann, and uh, I guess I'm still the, the president of this corporation, this ranch, but uh, I'm kind of an inactive president now. What is your corporation's name? The corporation's name is Virgil and Lee Spann Ranches Incorporated. Virgil was my father, and he and I have been working partners in like 1955, and we never have changed the name. 
So I've noticed that Y bar comes up here too. What names are you operating under for the ranches? The, the name that we commonly use is just Span Ranches, and that incorporates the ranches that we have uh, here and in Delta and in Montrose. And the Y bar is a portion, is just one ranch in the Span Ranches. Now, what do you mostly do here? We're in the cattle business, and uh, we raise hay to feed the cattle, and we raise uh, the calves, and which we sell, and we also feed them in, uh, in our places in Montrose and Delta. But uh, it's basically in a cattle business, that's it. We don't have any outside income. We don't have a very few outside interest. It's just a cattle ranch. So you're true cattle ranchers? Yes, we are true cattle ranchers, yes, yes. Has it always been that way on this on this ranch or on this property, or have you done other things as well for different revenue streams? No, we've always been always been cattle ranchers throughout my uh, my grandfather, my father, and myself. We've always just been a cattle rancher, just raised cattle. It's always been uh, it's always been good for us, and uh, we've had, we've expanded, but uh, we've never expanded on, into other fields into the tourist or the hunting or the fishing, it's always just been cattle. So you raise hay here too, why do you have hay? We raise a lot of hay here. We raise probably 2,000 ton of hay to feed in the, in the winter. The winters here are very extreme. They're very cold. We start feeding before Thanksgiving and uh, the, last, the last feeding we do will be the middle of June with the, with the bulls. And, uh, you better have here two ton of hay for every cow you want to keep all winter here. If you don't, some years you'll run out, some years uh, you'll have a little extra. But it's better to have extra hay than not to have enough. I guess the, one of the things that's interesting to me is that you have to be a little bit of a farmer to raise the hay to be a, a cattleman. <laughs> yes, you, yeah, uh, there, are, there are cowboys, there are cattlemen, and there are ranchers. And they're all different categories. The, a, good, uh, a good cattleman is a good cowboy and is a good farmer. So that's a, kind of a play on words, but uh, cowboys are usually not farmers, but ranchers can be farmers. Interesting. So do you, do you think that that's a, it's an, an important thing for a rancher to at least to, to be a cowboy so they have some idea of what's necessary or to just be able to hire cowboys and stick to the ranching and oh no it's it's really important to be a cowboy you got to understand what's going on in your business with the cattle with with how you handle them with that whole thing the the pay part of a ranch is the cattle and the expense part of the cattle is the farmer what does it mean when you say cowboy? What does it, in your head? What does the what are the job duties? <laughs> the job duties of a cowboy are to care for the cattle. So you are this is still at the stage where you're roping and you're branding and things like that. Yes, yes, roping, branding, doctoring, uh, health, uh, getting them on proper feed. Make sure the bulls are with the cows. Make sure that the cows are with the calves, and. Uh, Health is a, again is a big thing with the cattle. If they're not healthy, then they don't do well, and so the cowboy's job is the health of the cattle. But we have very few, or hardly any, cowboys. We have all of us do all the jobs. As far as just a straight cowboy, we don't have any. What is what what is the same as maybe some of our romanticized versions in the past of what cowboys do and what they do today? Is it the same job? Yes, yes. It's it's uh, more refined. It's more technical, uh, but the, the same thing: the health and the care of the cattle, and that's the basic basic thing. Is what is what, and I'm I'm going to get away from the cowboy thing. It's what ranchers do. What ranchers do. Okay, so now you have a very personal experience with what ranchers do. If you could tell me a little bit about when you started ranching 
and how it was when you were young and how it's changed over time for you personally. That's going to be a long story. It's going to be a long story, yeah. yeah just to be, you just go to it. Oh, uh, when I was young, a young person, all the hang, all the work was done with horses. And then where we did not have the semi trucks, we did not have that pro. And when you have uh, ranches that are 20 miles apart, you did all the work with horses. We drove the ho cattle up the road, right up, right through town, uh, to the ranges, worked them on the ranges, drove them home. All the work was done by horses, and uh, that is the main thing that has changed. Is that uh, we now use trailers, we now use semis. We use tractors rather than the horses. The horse, we still use a lot of horses tearing for our cattle in the mountains, but the big moves are done with trucks and uh, all the hangs done with mechan mechan tractors now, mechanical, and not with, not with horses. That's the biggest, biggest change. <clears throat> the other thing is the marketing. When I was a young person, uh, cattle were loaded on the railroad here and shipped to... Uh, Denver primarily, and now we load them on a on a semi, and they may go to uh, Kansas, Nebraska, Texas, from directly from here. And the railroad is no longer here, so the, that's another big change that has happened. The marketing system it used to be all the cattle went to uh, basically Denver to the stockyards where they were purchased by either feeders or by packers at that place. Now they are shipped, many of them are shipped directly to the feedlots from us. This is interesting because we went to the National Western Stock Show and we saw, we, we visited the, the mm -hmm. feed yards there, the stock yards there. It was something my dad used to tell me about and I'm sure that was in the 50s and mm -hmm. 60s when he came through here. So the nature of Denver has changed as a result of this as well, I'm assuming, the cattle industry in Denver. It's become less critical to the farmer. The, there, there is no cattle industry in Denver anymore. The, the only use for that stockyards is the National Western Stock Show. There is no market in, in Denver any longer. It used to be that whole stockyards, that whole complex, the National Western Complex was one huge stockyards, but it is, it's probably one-tenth of what it used to be, and there's no, they don't even have an auction in Denver anymore. The only use for the Denver Stockyards is the National Western Stock Show. And, but the, there's big there's big auction barns throughout the United States. There's one in, in Joplin, Missouri. There's one, there's two in La Hanna. There's one in Grand Junction. And most of the marketing now is done through auction barns or by direct sales. So uh, the business person me is fascinated by this because now the internet is the only thing that we use for any source of information. So when you had to market a cow in, what, what years are we talking about here that you shipped them to the railhead and that you had to market your cattle? We have 19... I think the railroad went out here about 1950, something like that. But before then, the railroad was no longer hauling cattle. I would say in the late, right after the World War II is when the marketing thing started to change. How would you... I mean, specifically, the steps that you would need to take in order to find out who might be willing to buy, buy your cattle in Denver. Do you come to your local area and you just bring a bunch of head in and, you know, 50 head of cattle and you say, here, you know, to your local guy, find a buyer? Or how does that work? Well, the, the, the buyers often would come to, come here and sell them direct. They would come from the Iowa, Illinois and, and buy cattle here spend a day or two days or a week around over the country, and they would maybe buy oh, two or three hundred head of cattle and ship them back to their place back there. That's when it started changing, when the order buyers came directly to the, to the ranches and started buying there. And then now that, that does not long has changed also. Now the cattle are shipped to the, to the sale barns primarily or directly to them. And uh, there's a big, a big video auction now that uh, the man comes out and uh, videos your cattle and then they put them on a screen. They have a, just a big screen and they will sell, I don't know, eight, ten thousand 10,000 cattle in one day on the video 
and you can bid by phone, you can bid on the internet, you can be there in person and bid, but you never see the cattle in person, you'll see them on the video. This is fascinating to me. I, if, I, if I can ask, what year were you born? 1933. Okay, so you've seen immense changes in technology, in transportation, in business, in marketing. You see tremendous changes in your lifetime of ranching. Was this a difficult transition for you to make, or was it something that you said, oh, this is so much easier to do it this new way? Well, you know, you really do it rather subconsciously because if the train doesn't come, then you got to do something different. So you load them on the truck. And if there's nobody here to buy them, then you hunt up someone to buy them. It's not a black and white situation. It's more of a gray situation where you trans kind of transpose through and uh, change with the times. Did you find that easy or difficult? I, I guess, huh? I guess it was not. It was not hard. It was just something that you had to do. So a rancher has to be a marketing person and a uh, livestock uh, overseer, and you have to have personnel experience and HR experience, human resources, and you have to be kind of a climatologist. I'm assuming. Is, was, is, this the, is, the, is the sale and marketing something that most cattlemen just say have somebody else do, or is that part of the fun part of ranching? It, uh, it depends upon the person. Uh, some people feel more confident in taking their cattle to an auction barn and let those professionals sell their cattle for a price. You know, they do that for a price, but there's some people who have confidence in their own ability to deal with, with that and are familiar enough with the market that they feel they can sell their own. We do both. We do both depending on the times. We try to market something all during the year, not just at one time. It used to be that in the fall they would load up a train load of cattle and send them to Denver and that was your marketing day. That was it. We try to sell something at least every two months because of the fluctuations in the cattle market. Uh, the cattle market is a very volatile thing and uh, it might be good today and it might be bad tomorrow, but if you have something on sale both days, it'll average out. Okay, so what kind of cattle, what, what breeds of cattle do you raise here? We, right now we're raising uh, Herefords and uh, black white face cattle. Well, why, From, do you, why do you like them? Why do you like them for this region? They survive the winter well. Those cattle, the Angus and the Hereford, survive the winter well. They have good hair. They do well at this altitude. That's something that you have to consider raising cattle in Gunnison. This is 7,700 feet here, and we go up to 10.5. And the air's a little thin at 10.5. And so you have to have cattle that will adapt to that. And, uh, and the other thing, we raise all our own replacements. And so the calf that was in that 10-5 next year may be the cow that's there in two years. It's very difficult to go out and buy cattle and bring them in because of the adaptability. Interesting. Okay, so now you, you have the hay for your cattle over the winter. Explain to the common person what it means to have a range cow and what they do for food and water and how much you have to help them out and how much you don't. Well, that one thing, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that makes ranching possible in Gunnison is the federal lands. Eighty some percent of our county is federal or state land and we have permits and leases on that federal land. They've been there for many, many years. And uh, in the, the grass in the mountains because of the moisture is very good. So being able to turn them out on this ranges and let them graze during like five months of the year is, is the only reason we can survive here. Um, in the winter we have to feed them because it's so cold. It's just like stoking a furnace. They have to have fuel in that body to keep warm when it's 25, 30 below to survive. And, uh, so in the winter we feed, in the summer they're uh, on the grass, basically. What kind of predators do you have to worry about here? Well, we don't have grizzly bears, and we don't have 
very few mountain lions. We have bears who I don't, I really don't consider bears a predator because they eat the animals after they've died. They did, some bears kill, but not very many. Uh, coyotes are our biggest predator who harm the calves in the spring. When the calves are just born, a coyote that learns to eat a calf will never forget. And so we're, we're fortunate we don't have wolves, we don't have grizzly bears, we have a few mountain lions. I know in the North Country they are really fighting with the wolves and with the grizzly bears, but we, we don't have that. So our predator problem is not our biggest, biggest problem. Okay, I want to transition for a second. I want you to talk about your family for a minute, if you would. I know that you have a long family, family history of being here. If you could start from the stories as far back as you remember of your grandparents or great-grandparents or great-greats when they came over, I believe, from maybe Switzerland, if you could tell us about your family history and how you got to the United States. <laughs> Okay, the, the Span family, my great-grandmother and great-grandfather did come from Switzerland and came here in 1878 and homesteaded a ranch this side of Crested Butte where my uh, family lived and uh, I was telling Abby, there was uh, I think three boys and four girls. Somewhere in their life, in the early part of their life, their father, the grandfather, packed up the two boys and went to Manila in the Philippines and left the mother there with the four girls on the ranch. Shortly thereafter, the mother died, and that left my grandmother with three young children to take care of. She had a very hard life. What was your grandmother's name? Olive. She had a very hard life, and uh, she and my grandfather were married, I believe, in about... 1900, somewhere around in that, in that area. And then they lived there in the Jack's Cabin Valley, which is south of Crest of Butte, for the, many years of their life. And uh, she was uh, pretty much the nurse, the midwife of that, of that valley, and uh, her life didn't get any, didn't get any simpler. Um, in the latter years, she moved to town and uh, my younger, her youngest son took over the ranch. Uh, my father was born there in the Jack's Cabin Valley, and uh, then he and my mother moved. They were married in uh, 1929, I believe, and uh, in 1930 they moved down here to this ranch down here, and my father started this place here. Um, he, he expanded it, and uh, then they went on from there. My grandfather on my mother's side was a railroad engineer on the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad and uh, was the eighth engineer that was hired by the DNRG and ran uh, an engine into the Floresta coal mine for many years and then lived at Cimarron and was uh, came through the Black Canyon to Gunnison and then uh, went over Cerro into Montrose as a help as a helper engine. In later years, he uh, ran the passenger train from Montrose to Grand Junction, and my, one of my greatest deals was riding the passenger train with my grandpa as the engineer going to going to down. Did to you the, get to ride in the front with him? With no, that? no, I didn't. He couldn't. He couldn't do that. Yeah. But I did get to ride in the train when he was there. So, uh, the, our, our later family, Polly and I, were married in 1953. We have four children. There's, how, I don't know how many grandchildren. How many grandchildren, Abby? Nine. I have nine grandchildren. So, okay. And they're grown now. My grandchildren are grown now. And uh, our one, one of the grandchildren is here on the ranch with us. Our son, Ken, is here on the ranch with us. Uh, our daughter, Jan, and her husband, uh, did you meet Jan? Is here on, our, in, on the ranch with us. And so we are very fortunate that uh, our family is, is interested in, in the ranch because I am not of the age that I couldn't run this place by myself. When you were young, could you run this place by yourself? That seems like a difficult thing. It was, it was a difficult thing. <laughs> it was a very difficult thing.
Tell me how you met your wife, first of all, and then I'll go into it later. Well, there's two different versions of that story. But, you know, Paula and I went to school together. And uh, she, she skipped a grade, and she caught up with me when we were in the eighth grade. And that's when I really first, first met her, going to school together. So. Where was that? In Gunnison. In Gunnison. We were very much natives. Very much natives here, and so. So you're probably, what, 13, 14? I'm trying to remember how old I was. Yeah, and... yeah, something like that. Okay, so did you, what, did you, were you sweet on her back then, or did it take a while? It took a while. No, I was sweet on her about then, but it took a while. Obviously, she's a very sharp cookie. So <laughs> yeah, to... yeah, I had to run fast. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, in high school, did you date at all? Or? Yes, yes, all the time in high school, yeah. Uh-huh. And then we got married in 1953. But she was from town, is that right? Yes. Uh -huh. Tell me about that. She she was she was a she was a townie that had a, a family. Her family had a cow or two, and that was it, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, this is during the war, and things were different during the war. You you raised a lot of your own things. You had your own garden and. Uh, her family lived there next to, next to Western State College, and her father was the business manager of Western State College. And they had two milk cows, and her brother raised rabbits, and they had a garden. And this was all primarily necessity because those things were not available. And uh, so the, her brothers would milk the cows, and they made butter and everything, just like living on a ranch. Her father was raised on a ranch in Crawford and uh, owned it for, for many years, and then, uh, then he sold it. So being, because she lived in town does not mean that she was not familiar with the ranch. But she was a, more into accounting in her family, correct? No, she was more into music in her family. Her mother was a great singer. She's a great singer, and uh, they really enjoyed that. But she worked for the, for the bank, and, uh, the bank and trust when I was in the army, and uh, so kept the books for us for many years, and so very very capable of that. So you you she's basically your your uh, grade school sweetheart. Yes. And you got a chance to marry your grade school sweetheart. I did, and we've been married for sixty five years. Yeah. So we've been going together pro probably seventy, which is pretty amazing nowadays. What was dating like back then? Fun. I mean, did you get to? Go out and <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was. Not necessarily true today. <laughs> so no, no, that is not. You don't really don't want me to answer I that because you know I don't think you want me to. What kinds of things would you do on a date? I'll night? tell you what we the, did. The, the, the things you could relate to me. How's I can that? tell you what we did. There was a, and it's still there. There's a dance hall in Almont, and I showed it to Abby yesterday. And there was a dance hall down underneath the lake. Uh, it's underneath the lake now, but it was down there. And every Saturday night, they had a dance in either one or the other. So every Saturday night, we would go to a dance, either at, they called it this one, the Wilderness, and this one is at Almont. And that's what, just like Abby did last night, we'd go, we'd go to the dance in the summer. In the winter, they didn't either work, but, uh, in the in the summer that we go to the dance every Saturday night. Do you ever do you ever have to have any do you have any competition for her or was it no. you know you met her and you both knew that was it? Well, I didn't have any competition that I knew of. <laughs> you, you're asking that to the wrong question to that person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so you both you both dated for a long time and then you got married and then you came here. Is that right? Yeah, we were. I was living here. I'm one of those unusual people who is living in the house that he was raised in, and there are very few people that are like that. You think about that. There's there's not a lot of people when they're 85 years old are living in the house that they were raised in. Yeah, and doing the same thing that you started doing. Yes. So when you, uh, as you went along, all of a sudden changes happened in the country. You, we came into a war. Tell me about that and what happened during World War II, correct? Or yes, uh, there was, it was a dramatic shift because of uh, the thing that affected us 
more directly other than the, the personal things was the lack of labor because there was no one, no one was here before. And uh, I can remember before the war, it was during the latter part of the Dust Bowl and uh, families would travel through here going to California and my parent, my father was able to uh, get help. Uh, people would work for him for maybe a month or maybe two months and uh, to make enough money to go on. And I can remember families coming and, and living and going. Well, when the war came, that that labor pool dried up and there, was, there wasn't any help. Uh, during the hang season, why, uh, I know that two of the local young ladies came in and hayed for us, drove teams and hayed for us, because there, there wasn't anybody to do it. Um, we had uh, rationing, of course, of the sugar and gas and the tiles and everything, but we were pretty fortunate. We were in an agricultural thing and could get uh, stamps for uh, tires and for gas and for sugar and that type of thing. But uh, it was changing in the lifestyle uh, that uh, the, all, the, all the news, all the, everybody's focus was on, was on the war. And uh, everybody, everybody had a family or had a person that was affected by the war, I mean directly affected by the war. Some had more drastic consequences than others. But uh, our, our problems, the local problems, the domestic problems that we had, were nothing compared to, to what some other people had. But it affects your life because you can remember, I can remember really, really well. And I, I must have been, well, when the war was over 45. I was 12 years old. I was driving a dump rake in Hang, right out here east of the house. And I heard all the sirens going off, the fire alarms going off in Gunnison. I could hear them. World War II was over. And I can remember that just as plain because everyone was so happy. It was done. But that's where I was when the world was over. It's one of those things you can remember. You can remember Pearl Harbor, what, uh, what you were doing. Uh, and uh, those things... That was the war. As a, as a 12 year old, you know, your kids that were just out of high school were gone and you were in uh, sixth grade. So all those things you affect, you affected your life for forever. So did you have any family members that joined the service? Yes. Yes, my uncle uh, drove a landing barge on Iwo Jima and uh, my uncle, that was really about the only direct one that I had. Did, did the government, because food was such an important thing, did the government want farmers and ranchers to stay and in food production? Yes, yes. My, my father did not go to the war because he was he was deferred because he was in food production, and they wanted people to stay home and produce food. It was as important a part as anything yes. in terms of... Yeah. Uh -huh. And it's a specialized skill set, too. So my assumption is is that if they, took, if they took anybody that had knowledge of farming and ranching, it really depleted the ability of the country to produce. Is that correct? Well, yeah, because if you don't, if you don't have any food, you're in big trouble. So, yes. Well, your great greats came over just after the civil, or started farming here after the civil war. So, <laughs> correct? Well, thirty years. Thirty years. So you've you've been in this neck of the wood for producing food for quite a long period of time. Well, since eighteen seventy eight. Yeah. yeah, it's a very specialized skill, and 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 I and I, it's interesting to me in both farming and ranching and all of these things. If, if it's a seasonal activity, you only have so many chances to get it right. I talked about a farmer once that talked about growing a tomato. He said, in order to learn to grow a perfect tomato, you have 30 chances if you farm for 30 years. 30 chances is it. Yeah. And if you mess up, that's it. You don't, you, all of this life experience that you gain over just being on a ranch or being on a farm and learning the ins and outs of cows and seasonal activity, that is such a institutional knowledge that takes time to gain that 
if you just try and plop somebody into farming or ranching, it doesn't really cut it. No, I think a really classic example of that is a calf. We have to get the bulls, and we have to get the bull with the cow at the proper time. And then nine months later, if nothing happens, if he doesn't eat the wrong weed, if he doesn't slip on the ice, all those things that happen, when that calf is born, when he releases from the cow, you have two minutes for that calf to breathe. And if there's the birth sack is over his face, if his head is down, if he's born backwards, he's gone. But within the time period from that calf's head comes out until he dies is two minutes because that is how long the mother's blood will sustain him outside the, outside the cow. So in, with nine months of work, you can lose it all in two minutes. And then you start over again. So now, one thing I do want to, I want to go over back to the thing that you talked about, uh, that you mentioned that got us started on this whole thing. Tell me about a Teamster and what a Teamster is in your mind and how you got into the concept of the Teamster activity. Well, that is real easy. I started driving a team when I was 10 years old and running a dump rake in hang. As I told you, I was 12 years old, I was doing it. But all the work was done with teams. And you had maybe, I don't know, 10 teams that did the work. And so that was, instead of having a truck or having a, some, a tractor to go do the work, you went and harvested the team. Of horses. Yeah, horses, sure. Sure. And uh, uh, if you fed the cattle, you pulled them with the team. If you uh, dug a ditch, you dug it with the team. And uh, that's, it's, it was just a natural thing that you learned to, to drive, drive a team. Uh, and it's one of those things you never forget. It's you do it. That's just what you did. You just drove a team. Well, you know, we, we I started going down the rabbit hole with this as we were researching because teamsters to people in my generation, you know, you you associate that with AFL CIO. Yeah. That's the concept, and yet you go back and you first thing you pull on Wikipedia is the horse heads on the logo. And and Ken did this little thing. At, at the moment that he unhitched, where that six horse hitch off the wagon, pulled the first two, the second two, and then he stopped Val and he said, okay, he got to talking about that they were moving a little bit. And he says, Val, I want you to back up here. And he got the horses to move sideways and then on that fifth wheel, move the, car move the horses this way and the front of the carriage, he rotated it. And then he started talking about the Teamsters and how how the skill that's required in moving horses sideways is immense and it might be very different from the skill that it takes to move a two horse hitch behind a plow hay. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, the, the, the basis for the width of the streets in Gunnison is so that you can turn the four horse hitch around in town. And when they, that's why the streets are as wide as they are in Gunnison. And they would turn around and then go down the street and then they would back back the wagon in so they could unload it so the thing wasn't clear, so the teams weren't clear across the street. They would back in and turn sideways and the teams were parallel with the street so the next team could go, go, go away. Oh, the skill that those people had is unbelievable with those. They could, I can remember my dad plowing a ditch standing on the that double tree that's in the back of the horses, guiding the team, pulling the pulling the ditcher. Yeah, what they did was unbelievable. If you think of the ditches and the roads, and this railroad that they built through here, they built with teams and slips. They didn't build it with caterpillars and backhoes. They built it with horses. Well, what he did, it it crystallized it immediately in my head. When we watched Val do that, Ken said, okay, now pull him back, do this, blah, blah, and she, and it just turned, it's parallel parking with a horse. I mean, <laughs> it's exactly what it is. And here I'm thinking, you know, it's hard enough to learn how to do parallel parking in a car when you've got this much space, but he effectively did that with the wagon and the team. <laughs> That's a real skill. Have you ever seen the big Budweiser horses? Yeah. 
the you've thing. seen you've seen them back in, and that is the that was a, just a just like a semi now back and in up here it's same same thing. So well, my my teams for things were very very limited just to the just to the ranch the things I did on the ranch with them, but we fed every day with the team on the sled, and you see these pictures of the. Team going out through the snow with a nice hay wagon or a nice sled on the back of it. Looks really nice, but it's colder than a booger. And it's every day, and it's hard, hard work. But the picture looks good. So what was your least favorite thing to do on the ranch? You know, I can't come up with one that is just plum least. I, I really can't. I, I like the life that I live. And the one reason that I have is because it's a variety of things. It's a year-round change. Uh, shoveling snow is not a lot of fun. Feeding cattle every day is not a lot of fun. Getting in the river and lifting rocks is not a lot of fun. But it's different every day. And uh, I don't have anything that I really dislike. The reason that I really like it, again, is because when I get up this morning, I don't know what's going to happen today. It's different every day. And uh, uh, to be, if I was in an office, I would go crazy. Because there's something, there's something that happens every day. And the seasons here change. It's summer now. Soon it'll be fall. We do, we're irrigating. In a month from now, we'll be, we'll be mechanics working on the machinery. A month from there, we'll be working cattle. A month after that, we'll be again mechanics, feeding, taking care of that. In the spring, we have the babies born, concentrated effort for 45 days, right there day and night. Then we turn the water on again, and we go become irrigators. So it's a, it's a challenging life. If you had to do it all over again, would you? Yes. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have to our social media sites. Our Twitter feed is at Backyard Green Films, spelled B-K-Y-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Instagram is at Backyard Green Films, B-A-C-K-Y-A-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Facebook is Backyard Green Films. Our YouTube URL is youtube.com Backyard Green Films. We would like to thank Lee Spann for allowing us to visit his ranch and speak with him today. If you'd like to find out more about him and Span Ranches, please visit their Facebook page at Span Ranches, Inc. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. We'd also like to thank Ken Spann for introducing us to his father, a legend in Colorado ranching, and for explaining to us what an original Teamster is. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2019.